the Dancing with Wisdom podcast. Hello and welcome again to the Dancing with Wisdom podcast as we continue ex to explore the wonder of wisdom. And it's great to have Elliot with me here as we have these fascinating conversations together. And I hope that uh, we are going to dive deeper into what you were describing last time, and that is uh, the wonder of wisdom. And we talked a lot about um, scripture. That's right. We went. To, yeah, we talked about uh, from the first book of the Bible, Genesis, where wisdom is first mentioned. I was left. I was left feeling like I wanted a bit more. Okay. I felt. I felt like I was. I felt like we were just skimming on the surface, yes. which I suppose we do here and ask I those questions. I mean, that's questions. all we can really do in one sense because this is such a rich concept, and and our aim is to convey well my aim to you to convey the wonder but also to our listeners obviously as well that this is such an amazing subject and i think when we enter the area of wisdom we want to enter it with a sense of reverence and awe and wonder to be full of wonder you know wonderful is full of wonder uh, and we started to try and do that as i talked about um from the book of genesis and with the man and the woman in the garden and that story about um how it all went wrong because while the woman wanted to desire to gain wisdom she went about it the wrong way by listening to the lies of the snake but wisdom is still a wonderful subject it's and it as it were draws us in in captivating and enchanted ways and as I was thinking about this podcast, I wanted, I've, I've, I've got some notes on my phone here, so I just need to bring it up. Um, in Proverbs chapter 30, verses 18 to 19, let me try and convey and communicate something of that wonder to you. So this is the writer of Proverbs, and what they're saying is, there are three things that are too amazing for me, four that I do not understand. The, and these are the four. The way of an eagle in the sky the way of a snake on a rock, the way of a ship on the high seas, and the way of a man with a young woman. So what he's saying is there are three things that are amazing, four things that are mysterious, but also communicate something of the wisdom and wonder of the world we live in. And they all begin with this, soaring eagles in the sky, slithering snakes on a rock, sailing ships on a high sea, and the most intriguing of all, the sexual chemistry between a man and a woman. Those communicate something of the, wis of the wonder and the wisdom of the world that, that's been, that, that he's created for us. Hmm. I'm kind of just sort of staring at you thinking, <laughs> where okay, is he going? Where, where are we going with Where are we this? going with this? We're going in a sense, I mean, all of those obviously had, had a certain mystery. And I think, this is the key thing is that we need to get past all the cynicism and confusion and complexity of the world and look with a sense of bewildered curiosity, like a little child that looks at the world thinking, wow, this is incredible. What is this? You know, like, like a child, you know, looks at slithering snakes, looks at soaring eagles, looks at sailing ships. And obviously, as, as young men look at young women thinking... Wow. Or like the first man looked at the first woman and literally said, wow, you know, this is flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. She's amazing. And I mean that in a good way, in a wholesome way. Unfortunately, so much of our world has become cynical, become very me-centered about my own self-gratification. Wisdom wants to say, you can look at this world with excitement and with thrill and with joy and without the baggage of embarrassment and shame and cynicism and negativity it's possible to do that yeah so how <laughs> okay so we started that off in a sense with um with talking about the problem that was created with the man and the woman in the garden and how they were tempted by the snake and if we're going to look at that through the biblical scripture, um, the book there are three books par excellence in the Old Testament. And there's a lot more we could go, and there's a lot more in the New Testament. But we're just going to cover on this podcast and maybe touch a little bit into the New Testament uh, on, on wisdom in the Old Testament. And those, as it were, I said, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. And Proverbs 
is presented to us as a bright young woman, a bright young lady. She's called Lady, no, lady Wisdom. If you like, is this very sharp, uh, sharp teacher who's, who has lots of pithy sayings, you know, um, all hard work leads to a profit. You know, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean on, on not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. You know, um, do the, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, do, do the right thing and good results will follow. And it says in Proverbs that she is a, a tree of life. Remember back in Genesis, that tree of life? Mm-hmm. There's a tree of life to all who embrace her and all who, who cling to her will be blessed. So there's this promise of wisdom that you do the right thing and good will happen. Now, for young children, that's a great, that's really good. But as we get older, we begin to see that life isn't fair. Life doesn't happen the way that Proverbs says. There are lots of Proverbs, you know, the, 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 these short couplets of sayings that, that really sort of grip us. We think, actually, it's not fair, actually, because things don't always go that way. And, if, 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 and Proverbs is written in such a way that it pairs lady wisdom with, with somebody who we can call Mistress Folly. And she's really presented as, as a prostitute, as someone who is very captivating, is very beautiful, but actually leads those who follow her, leads, her ast- leads them astray, ultimately to death and destruction. And we're given this choice. Are you going to listen to, Madam Wis- to, to Lady Wisdom or are you going to listen to Mistress Folly? Because those two paths are presented to you. And those two paths are presented to us in life as well. What appears to be, again, there's a, there's a proverb that there's, there's a way that, that there, there's, there's a way that appears right to it to a man, but the end, in the end leads to, to destruction. So is there a, a form of education <laughs> required? I'll say that again. Is there a form of education required to pass down from, say, parents to youngsters to be able to make that? Well, in Proverbs, it certainly talks about that. It talks about the, the role of, of parents to bring their children up in the as it says in the fear of the lord because the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom and it's interesting you say about the fear of the lord because this is the thing i think people who don't know um would automatically i mean let's face it a lot of people like saying where is god when this happens and and you know you have to do this or god will strike you down you know yes that's right people have that but it isn't that isn't the fear yeah, it's not an unhealthy terror of, of God, which means that I'm completely paralyzed and I can't do anything because that's not the way that God works. Yes, there's a sense that he is the one who is who knows all things, sees all things. And that's what, in a sense, what's fantastic because you're leading. Cause, because the second book I want to talk about is the book of Ecclesiastes. And Ecclesiastes, if you like, is the middle-aged cynical critic because he looks at the world and he says, hold on, hold on. When I look at this world, I see those who are ruthless and those who are arrogant. I see them prospering. I see those who are cheating get, um, get away with it. I see those who work hard and are honest crumbling and, and, and being discarded and, and being passed by. And he talks about life under the sun, by which he means life without reference to an infinite creator. And he mm. says, it just doesn't make sense. And then the more he looks at it, the more, as it were, restless he gets, the more disquieted he gets, because he says, he says, I mean, he, in a sense, through the book, he says three things. He says, one, that life just keeps moving on. So, you know, what is topical and important one day is completely forgotten the next. <laughs> you need to look at our newspapers about what they were talking about, say, five years ago and what they talk about now. I mean, they just forget the past and just carry on with, their, with, their, with, with whatever is latest and loudest. So this relentless progression of time. Then you have this sense of, the, you know, which we touched touch on, the, the huge injustice that there is and how things just hit you left field. You know, you're, you're going along and suddenly something comes that you had, you know, <laughs> classic point, what happened in 2020 in in, in, in um in, in, in a meat market in, in, in Wuhan that affected the whole world. Nobody could have imagined that. It was completely left field. You know, some people might be talking about it, but it was very little. We guessed that our world would be turned upside down the way they were. So there's things that can hit us from left field, both globally, but even personally. You know, you could get an e- email today or tomorrow that can completely rock your world for the next six months, which has happened to me. Or, and then, the, so that's two things. So this relentless progression of time, things that can happen left field that we have no inkling of, 
and the fact that we're all going to die. Now that's a depressing thought, isn't it? <laughs> you know, these things. And but that's what the, that's what this cynic in in Ecclesiastes says. And he says it just doesn't make sense. So he goes on this long journey, trying to make sense of it under the sun, and literally getting nowhere. And then at the end, in chapter twelve, he says, "Well, here's the conclusion of the matter." He says, "Well, actually." What Lady Wisdom was saying was right, because you do have to fear God and keep his commandments, because ultimately, one day, everything is going to be revealed for what it is. And every hidden thing is going to be exposed. Everything that's done in secret is going to be laid bare before him whom we must give account. So what you must do is fear God and keep your fear God. The, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A right fear, a right reverence, a right wonder of the life that you've been given, because it can be taken away from you. You know, the sense that, you know, there's somebody in a hospital somewhere who's wishing that they had your life and my life, Elliot. The fact that they could mm. walk around, they could mm. they could do things they can do because they're stuck in, in, in a hospital bed somewhere. Or somebody on the other side of the world who wishes that they could have the freedom to communicate that the way that we can and not worry about what um, a government might say in terms of silencing them. So would you also say that part of this in today's world... Yeah is appreciation for what we do have focus on the on the things that we do have which are of which are the positives absolutely yeah um and and realizing just how lucky we are and maybe by putting the focus on those and it could be something very small yes that could be a step towards a more positive absolutely so i mean appreciation is part of living in wonder because when you know why is it elliot and you and i are living here in in an affluent country with food on the table, mm. not worried about secret police. We're not in, I don't know, sixth century Mongolia. No disrespect to Mongolians in the sixth century, but their life was very different <laughs> to what we can enjoy and do now. Yeah. Um, but, there, but, there's, but there's no rhyme or reason, you know, why we have the opportunities that we have. We have the wonders of technology to connect through this podcast with people literally all over the world. I mean, I mean, it's it's wonderful, wonderful. It's amazing. It's just, it's mind blowing. You know, if you said this to our grandparents, you know, they would be their, their minds would be blown. You know, with 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 what we can do. Yeah, it is one. Yeah, I get it. The wonderful. I I do appreciate that. But there is an inner wisdom that if we're mm. not careful, that wonderful which we're saying right now could get wonderfully out of control. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it could. Exactly. And what do you mean by in, in, in the sense that we, we lose that perspective? Is, is that what I you... think it's a sense that we lose the basics of wisdom. Yes. Like well, we're talking about scripture here, the original teachings. Yes. You know, we can lose that. We can, and, and I think uh, you, you touched on um, about how, uh, was it in a previous podcast where you said about how we want to be like God-like and have all that power and being in control. And that's, that's a dangerous place that's to the, be. Yeah. And, and that's a daily reminder. You see, this is the thing. We have to keep reminding ourselves of this every day. You know, one of the things I find particularly sobering is is the life of Solomon. I mean, Solomon, we're told, was the wisest man who ever lived. And yet, you know, and he had he wrote all these amazing proverbs. He had he had a large part to play in the book of Ecclesiastes that we just talked about. But the sad tragedy is that when you actually look at his personal life, it was a disaster in, in the sense of how he disobeyed God. Um, you know, he... <laughs> He had 600 wives and 400 concubines. He amassed um, large amounts of wealth. He imported horses from uh, Egypt, which he was told not to do in direct disobedience to what God had said. And the verdict on his life at the end was that he had done evil. I mean, if you like, that's, you know, what's on our tombstone when we die? People can write all sorts of things. But what matters at the end is what God thinks. And if God's ultimate verdict on it was that he did evil, that's tragic. And this is about the man who was the wisest man who ever lived. And so that this is the thing that's quite sobering, is that you and I can sit here and talk about the wonders of wisdom, and we can then fail in our personal lives. That's, mm. that's why this is something that we have to keep on working on every day. Um, and I think deep down people know if they're on the right path or not. Yes. I think there's a lot of line to ourselves yes yeah. you know if you think back to you know a bad decision and you think you kind of justify it. i'm going to do it because yes. yeah I'll, I'll do it because it, it could mean this yes. and often it's often it's a safe route yes you know it, it's uh yes, it's not going is, in the storm and having faith yeah the, yeah the capacities for self-delusion that we have 
is, mm. is natural. But you know, but but it's so deep. I was just reminded. So it's so deep rooted. I, one of my well, one of my children when they were very young. Okay, I've got four kids. Is uh, well, actually, I'm going to give it away. He. Okay, I've got three girls and a boy. <laughs> so he. He was about two or three years old, and he climbed up onto um, uh, onto a shelf, and he'd eaten all this all this all this chocolate, and. And he had it there, and I looked at him, and and, and he he looked at me straight faced. He, he knew he'd done wrong, and he said, "Priya, who's his elder sister, Priya did it." Just straight face, <laughs> <laughs> without <laughs> blushing an eyelid or anything. He was, he, and I thought, "You're only three years old," and immediately you're passing the blame onto something. You know very well that you did it all, and that's. I mean, I'm poking fun at my younger at my son, but. But that's all of us. All but it's of an us interesting like, point. All of us Three years old. Yeah. Three years you old. Know. Now you're not, you're, you ne- have never come across to me like someone who pushed past the blame somewhere else. But so all where, of us all so, do. No, no, no. I, oh, no. Oh, 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 I'm, so I've, where, where, does some, where does someone pick that up, that, that reaction right. at three years old? That's right. It's, it's very deep rooted. But, you know, it is, but I mean, not digressing too much here, but I, I was pulled short by my um, kids when we were younger as well. And this is just giving an example of this challenge of living in, in wisdom was that we were giving each other nicknames. Uh, just as, as 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 a family joke, and what my kids gave me the nickname Puddle Lum, which really upset me because it made me realise that my kids see me. Well, if you don't know who Puddle Lum is, he's he's a character in uh, the Narnia, Lionel Witch and Wardrobe series of books, who is a very dour, very negative kind of person. And I thought my kids see me as very negative, very cynical, very jaded. So I've had to work on this myself. That's the point mm. I'm getting at. I've been the middle-aged critic, cynic of Ecclesiastes, and I've had to pull myself up short because I've been challenged by the biblical scriptures that I'm not practicing what I preach. I don't live the way that I'm called to live. Mm. Uh, and that, in a sense, got me on the quest of the whole wisdom journey because I realized that, that if, unless something gets sorted out, I don't like the man who I'm looking at in the mirror. He's, he's not somebody who I particularly like. And how old were you when that happened? So I talk about it in the book, but it, the seeds of it really took root uh, in 2001. <laughs> my, my third daughter pokes fun at me. It was, it was the year that she was born. Um, <laughs> but it's had, it had nothing to do with her. But it was a sense of what I'd sort of reached everything that I wanted to. I'd become a consultant psychiatrist. I got top of the career ladder. I had a ha- happy, healthy family. I had good income coming in. I had um, a, a responsible role in the church we were part of, but I had a profound sense of emptiness. And in that emptiness was an anger and cynicism that I could see was brewing up. And the way it manifested itself was by finding fault in people around me. Mm. And the people who felt that the most were, were my wife and children. And that, you know, that goes back to my kids then calling me puddle them as well and seeing that negative cynicism, which is like a cancer. And I think what also terrified me was looking at people getting older and seeing how common that is. And unless you make a deliberate effort, the culture and the atmosphere around you can easily suck you into that. But I just want to actually, you know, because I said to you, I would talk about three. Yes. And, and because this leads into that third book and that holds part of the solution is, is the story of Job. And Job is a fascinating character in, in the Old Testament because what we read about Job is that he's, you know, he's very successful. He has all the outer trappings of success. He's got a healthy family. He's got lots of wealth. He's got lots of livestock. And you have this, and he, and he trusts God and he worships God. And what's interesting in, in, in Job is that you read about that and then the scene shifts to a conversation between God and the snake. Remember we talked on the previous yep. podcast about the snake yep. uh, called, called, called Satan or the, called the, the evil one. And basically, God says to Satan, says, have you seen my servant Job? There's no one who worships him in the world like like him. And Satan's cynical response is the reason he does that is because he's got everything. Why wouldn't he love you? Because he's, he's, got, he's got health, he's got wealth, he's got a loving family. That's why he does, does that. And God says to Satan, okay, I give you permission to test him. You can't kill him but you can do what you like apart from killing him. And then through the next sort of several chapters, it all goes badly wrong for for Job. And he loses his health, he loses his family, 
you know, he, he hits disaster after disaster. And initially his response is very noble in terms of he says, you know, even if he slays me, yet still will I praise him. And he's, but he's quite clear in his own mind. Why is this happening? I, I, I don't understand it. I don't understand. It. And, the, you know, three comforters come and the best thing they do is they don't say anything for the first week or two. But then they start coming up with the Proverbs. You know, it's, you know, it must be because you've done some wrong. It must be because God is punishing you for this. And finally, as it were, Job loses it. And he's furious with God. He says, why are you doing this to me? Why are you allowing this to happen to me? I want you to explain to me why are you are doing this. And what's fascinating is in chapter, I think it's chapter 42, is God does show up. But God in his wisdom doesn't show up with the way that you expect. He doesn't come up and say, well, actually, Job, this is a test between Satan and me to, to prove your worth. He doesn't say that. What, what God does is he, he basically shows Job these two amazing creatures, one of which is called, I think, Behemoth and the other is Leviathan. So Behemoth is like a, is like a dinosaur kind of creature, people think. And Leviathan is this great creature of the East. And what he says, look at these creatures. They're huge. They're magnificent. They're so huge and magnificent they could kill you. But they're still good. Everything I've created is good. And I want you to look with awe and wonder at the world I've created. I want you to think, did you put the stars in the sky? Can you name the stars one by one? Can you understand how the seasons work? And the fascinating thing is that God's response to Job's suffering and his questions of why is just look at me. Look at me with awe and wonder and worship. That's all you need to do. I'm not going to give you an answer. I'm just going to get you to gaze at me in my wonder and magnificence. And that's what Job does, because all mm -hmm. he can do is just bow down and worship and say, you are God. I'm just a human being and I'm amazed at your love for me. And God does restore everything back to Job. But I think what, if you like, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes and Job, they're different facets of the diamond of wisdom because they show us how mysterious and marvellous this is. Because, you know, modern man, OK, we've got all our technology. We've got our iPhones. We've got our computers. We can do amazing things. We want to go to conquer, you know, we, we want to go and colonise Mars and all this kind of stuff, or go to the moon and all this kind of stuff. But really, we can't call the shots. And we like to conveniently forget that, that we're going to die one day. We quite conveniently forget that something can hit us from left field that we, that we have no control over. But there is the infinite intelligence, there is a supernatural intelligence, and there is this, if you like, this battleground between forces and good where the human soul is at stake. And who we are becoming is far more important than anything we try and do or achieve in this life. Mm -hmm. That's the wonder of wisdom. And it's living with that. And the promise of wisdom, ultimately, is shalom. And I love and Shalom is a Hebrew word, which is incredibly rich. And the, and the best definition is someone called Andrew Parnham. And, and I just love his definition. He says, Shalom, and get this, just, just, just listen to it, Elliot. This is so powerful. And I'll say it slowly. It's wholeness for the whole person. Okay, I haven't finished there. Wholeness for the whole person. So the whole of you, for the whole person. So body, mind, and spirit, and your relationships, and everything you do for the whole of life. Not just for part of life, but for the whole, from the moment you're born to the moment you die, for the whole of life, wholeness for the whole person, for the whole of life, extending to the whole of the cosmos. I mean, that's mind blowing. That's what the promise of wisdom is. It's, it's something that encapsulates everything in the universe. And that's, what it's, that's what's at stake. Because if you like, this life is a battleground between forces of good and evil. And... You know, we get glimpses of that in, in the movies, you know, in Lord of the Rings or you think of your latest blockbuster movie of what, what's it called? The Avengers, whatever, Avengers series. Those, they're, they're little glimpses of the real story that is happening. You know, history is his story. And you're invited into that. You're a key component of that. Um, that's the wonder of wisdom. It's uh, it's really interesting. This podcast, I've uh, I've just enjoyed sitting back and just kind of listening and enjoying it. I think you've raised some really interesting points. I'm going to go and reflect on that. Why don't you just do a quick sixty second summary? Wow. So what I'm trying to say with the wonder of wisdom is it's like a diamond, and there are different facets of that diamond that you can look at, and you will never tire of gazing at it. I mean, it says elsewhere that angels long to look at these things. Because we've been put on this earth, on this planet, 
for a finite period of time. None of us knows how long. And it, we're called to do that in awe and wonder, to regain that childlike curiosity. The challenge and the battle is to give in to cynicism and despair and hopelessness. And that's what this culture and world wants us to do. Or it wants us to put, invest all our eggs in this life. But this life will never satisfy. It'll never give you the things that you really long for. Mm. And what I really want to encourage our listeners to do is to realize that God is offering wisdom in its all its fullness. And ultimately, Jesus, he's, he's, that, he, he's, he's the one who we hunger for. You know, all, 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 of, all of your life, all of my life, all of your life, Elliot, you've been on a treasure hunt. And what I want to say is, is that, um, and that treasure for a perfect person in a perfect place, Jesus is that person. And heaven is that place. My friend, it's a fantastic place to stop. So, Neil, thank you so much for today. And we will see uh, and hear, speak to everyone in the uh, next episode of Dancing with Wisdom. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you. You've been listening to the Dancing with Wisdom podcast, presented by Sunil Raheja. For details on the Dancing with Wisdom book and its accompanying workbook, please visit drsunil.com. If you know someone who would enjoy this podcast, then please share it. Give it a thumbs up on YouTube and help it grow by leaving a nice review. Life's challenges can diminish, define or develop you. Which will it be? Make sure you hunger for the wise one. The choice is yours. <laughs>